Good evening, everyone. Again, welcome to our Wednesday night dinner. Hope you got your Bibles tonight. You are joining along with us as we continue our study uh, in the book of Romans. Now, before we even get started on tonight, I do want to let you know that the passage that we are about to embark upon is a very rich and meaty section that Paul is going to cover uh, tonight. By fact, we're in Romans chapter 6. So if you got your Bible, it's going to be turning to Romans chapter 6. That's where we are going to get started on tonight. We are going to ask God to help us as we venture into this section of the book of Romans. So let's open up with a prayer tonight. Father, again, we thank you. We thank you that we can come together uh, through Facebook, through conference call, uh, through YouTube, that we can just spread your word. But Father, we understand that this is a very meaty and rich text. So I'm asking you, Father, to be with me as I try my best that you allow the Holy Spirit to work through me to illuminate your word, uh, not only to me, but as I share it with your people. Father, again, we thank you for our study tonight. For it's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen, everyone. Tonight, we are going to be looking at, and I want to entitle the subject tonight is Dead to Sin and Alive to God. Dead to Sin and Alive to God. Amen. As I said, this, this text got a lot of meat on the bone. Um, we're not going to try to go too fast. We probably won't get too far because it's such, it's so meaty that you'll probably get choked if we hurry ourselves through this and don't have time to chew on it uh, tonight. But chapter number six actually starts off from chapter five. Now, let me just kind of bring us up to where we are so that you understand the rhetorical question that Paul is about to ask. Now, in Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through chapter 3, verse 20, Paul establishes a need for righteousness. And then in chapter 3, verse 21, through chapter 4, verse 25, he explains how God justifies the sinner. And he uses Abraham as an example of what it means to be justified by faith. And then when we get to chapter 5, he describes some of the results of justification. He talks about how we have peace with God. He also talks about uh, how we have access uh, to Jesus and how we can rejoice in the truth, even in our suffering. Then he concludes chapter 5 by reflecting the, on the interest of sin and its consequences. So then he's going to explain in the latter part of chapter 5, he talks about God's second Adam, which was Jesus Christ. Then you get to the very end of chapter 5. He says in verses 18 through verse number 20, he talks about how the first Adam brought condemnation, but the second Adam brought justification. And then he said this very famous statement. He says, for where sin abound, where sin increases, Grace much more abound, or grace increases the more. Now, again, you can't stop right there at chapter 5, because here's what Paul is about to do. He's about to go into chapter 6, and I want you to notice the question that he's about to ask. In verse number 1, he said, what shall we say then? 
Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Now, Paul is asking this question, not expecting an answer. By a fact, the question he asks is actually a statement that he's trying to get the Roman believers uh, to see. Now, you and I probably wouldn't be no different. Now, these Roman Christians did not ask Paul this question. Paul had probably been preaching justification over and over again, probably every synagogue he went to, every marketplace he ever went to, every church that he went back, he would always preach justification by faith. So Paul knew what was on the minds and on the hearts of people when they heard him talk about being justified by faith. He knew what was in their mind because maybe somebody at one time or another had asked him, well, Paul, if what you're saying is true, if you are saying this thing about God's grace, and if you are saying that grace supersedes or superabounds our, our sin, then it's only logical that the more we sin, the more grace we want to get from God. Now, ain't that just logically thinking? That if I want to really experience the grace of God, the, I want more of God's grace. And I think all of us want more of God's grace. Now, if you want more of God's grace, according to what Paul had said, then all I got to do is keep right on sinning. So the more I sin, the more grace I'm going to receive from God. Now, that's the question that Paul knew was on their mind. Now, so how is he going to answer that? What is the answer to the question? Well, if I want more grace, I just sin more. When you get to verse 2, Paul is going to tell us how about that answer. But I want you to look at a very important word in verse number 1. Now notice it with me in verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin? You see that word continue? Epimino is the Greek and that word literally means to tarry in a place. It means to persevere or denoting the action persisted in. Or it means to abide. Some versions may use the word remain. Paul said the question on the flow is, what shall we say then? Shall we remain in sin? Shall we stay? where we are, so that we will receive uh, more grace. Now again, notice now, Paul is not talking about the person that just commits sin. Uh, we're going to find out further on in the book of Romans that we all sin. But what he's dealing with here is the person that habitually sins, the person that continues to sin, or the person that remains or stay in their sin. They thought, if I stay there, the more grace I'm going to get. That ain't what Paul is saying. So Paul now is about to answer the question. Now, let me help all of us, because he's not going to answer the question in verse 2. He's going to start to answer the question in verse 2. It's going to take him three chapters to really answer the question in, chapter, in verse 1. Chapter, the remainder of chapter 6, chapter 7, and chapter 8. It's going to take him three chapters to answer one rhetorical question. Now, how long is it going to take him to answer it? I don't know. 
If you stay with me, it may take us a year, may take two years to answer this one question. That's why I encourage you to go ahead and read ahead so that I won't have to read all of these verses when we get to our Bible study. Now, here's how he's going to start off answering that question. He says, King James Berry said, God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Now, what does Paul say? How does he answer the question? Shall we stay in our sin so that we can receive more grace? He said, God forbid. Let me give you that from another translation. Another one says, certainly not. Uh, of course not. Far be the thought. Uh, perish the thought that you have. Another one said, may it never be. Another one said, by no means. Let it not be. Another verse that says, absolutely not. I like the verse that said, this is unthinkable. Away with that kind of notion, with that kind of idea. It is just incomprehensible for you to think that the more you sin, the more grace you're going to receive. So therefore, I just keep right on sinning. You ever heard somebody make this statement? They may know what they are about to do is wrong, but they'll go ahead and say, well, I'm going to go ahead and do it. That I just ask God to forgive me after I do it. Because I believe that God's grace is going to overtake or overshadow or is going to over uh, supersede the sin that I'm about to commit. I've heard people make a statement like that. That's a dangerous statement to make. I'm going to go ahead and sin and then I'm going to ask God to forgive me because I know he will, because his grace is going to abound much more over my sin. I wouldn't take my chances with that kind of attitude. Paul said, God forbid, certainly not. Don't even think that way. Don't even let that kind of idea come up in you and come up out of your mouth. Your mouth. So he says, God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Now, again, here's the question. I think Paul wasn't really wanting them to answer the question. He just saying it to get them to see themselves. Paul even makes mention and says similar stuff like that in Ephesians chapter 2. In Ephesians chapter 2, in verse number 1, Paul says, And you have he quickened who were dead in uh, trespasses uh, and sin. Now, I want you to notice what Paul is saying. Because in one place he says you was dead in it. Another place he says, you was dead to it. Before we were dead in sin. That's Ephesians 2, 1. But now we are dead to sin. Once you become a believer, once you accept Jesus Christ by faith in him, now you are dead to the sin. Before you became a Christian, you were dead to in sin, when Jesus Christ died on the cross, before you accepted him, you were dead in your trespasses and in your sin. But once you became a child of his, you died to sin. So now I am dead to it. In other words, He's going to tell us later that sin no longer rule, sin no longer ring in your mortal bodies. 
In other words, sin no longer controls you. Sin no longer dominates you. Why? Because you dead to it. And if you are dead to it, guess what? Dead people don't sin. Don't continue to sin. If you have died to it, you don't keep on uh, doing it. And I like what he says in verse number three. Because when you get to verse three, he says, no, you not, that so many of us that were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. Now, don't you know? You see what, he, what he's saying? I, I can just hear Paul now may change his tone as he was writing this. I can see Paul saying, surely you guys know this. Don't you know? I, I think Wimber said, don't you know? Are, are you ignorant to this fact? Have, have you forgotten maybe what he's saying? Maybe he said, are you unaware that when you was baptized into Christ, have you not been taught these things? Are you not without knowledge? Surely someone explain to you what baptism means. Maybe Paul is saying, maybe you didn't catch it. When you was baptized, did you really understand what was taking place? See, if you don't know or understand what it means to die, to sin, you may not understand what baptism really means. And if I was to ask you the question, could you take five minutes and explain to me what it really means to die to sin. Could you do it? Because you needed to understand. Because baptism, as Paul is going to help us to see, is that you need to understand you have died to this. And you were baptized into Christ. When was I baptized? I was baptized when I died died uh, to uh, sin. It may be possible a lot of people have been baptized that never died to sin. And you can look at some of our actions and our reactions, and that will help us to see maybe we hadn't died to something. We are still habitually continuing in the same sin that we was in before we were baptized. Notice how Paul says it. Paul says, know you not? Don't you know? Have you forgotten? Why do we keep going back into our old way of life if you have died to it? So Paul here asked another rhetorical question. Know you not that as many of you that were baptized into Christ Jesus, don't you know you were baptized into his death? Notice he says in verse 4, he said, therefore, therefore what? Therefore, since you have died to sin, and you were baptized into Jesus Christ, and you were baptized into his death. Therefore, you are buried with him by baptism unto death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, he says, even so we also should walk in newness of life, that there must be a change. 
There must be a difference in the way we react. It, there must be a difference in the way we live. We live a new life. When? After we have been baptized into Christ's death and we are raised up, he says, unto the glory of the Father. Once that happened, you now walk, you live in a different life. Now, Paul is giving us some very meaty stuff here. He said, first of all, you got to die to sin. You got to be buried with him in baptism. And you're going to arise. You're going to come up out of the Christ, out of the water, as a like Christ was resurrected. You want to be resurrected as well. That's what he's going to tell us in the very next verse. Now, how does all of this happen? How does God take what Jesus Christ did 2,000 years ago, because when he was nailed to the cross, my sins were nailed to the cross. When he was buried and I buried in Walla like him, guess what? Something takes place. And just as Christ was resurrected to live, guess what? I also am resurrected as well. Now, what all entails in that? It's going to take Paul to really help us all to understand it. That's why I said he's going to take three chapters to unfold what he's trying to get us to see. Now, if you don't see it tonight, don't worry about it. Because it's going to be a long, drawn-out discussion of what Paul is dealing with. He's going to get them to see this, but it's going to take a while. So if you don't really grasp it, if you don't really see how all of this takes place and, how, and what really happens in baptism, and in my resurrection, when I come up out of that water, if you don't really understand it all, stay with Paul. Don't stay with me. Stay with Paul. Because Paul is going to help us. Notice what he said in verse 5. He says, for, joining verse 5 with verse 4, verse 4 with verse 3, Verse 3 with verse 2 and 2 with 1 and 1 with chapter 5, verse 18 through 20. All of this goes together. Can we see it? He says, for if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. We've been planted, he says, together in the likeness of his death. You see that word planted? Some versions may use another word besides planted. It actually comes from the Greek word sophunos. Sophunos in the Greek literally means to be united with. Or to be identified with. So what is Paul actually saying? Paul is actually saying, notice the verse now. He said, for if we have been identified, or if we have been planted, or if we have been united together in the likeness of his death. Now keep in mind, we have been united together with Christ. How? In the likeness of his death. Now, how, what is that? It is like Christ died. You and I die. When Christ was nailed on the cross, you and I was nailed on the cross. And you may say, I ain't never been nailed on the cross. Yes, you have, whether or not you realize it or not. Because when Christ was nailed on that cross, all of us was nailed right along with him. 
That's why he said we have been united with him. We have been identified with him. How? In the likeness. Just like he was in his death. So have we. But not only have we been united or identified or planted in the likeness of his death. He says when that happened, we shall also See that word also? We shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. So not only have we been identified with him, not only have we been planted with him in his death, but we have been identified with him in his resurrection. I like what Paul said in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 11. He said, this is a faithful saying. For if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. Now, now don't, don't miss that little word with. Because if we are dead with him, we also going to live with him. And you say, well, how long is Christ going to live? Paul going to explain it as we go through these next few chapters. He said, just like he died once and now he lives forever. Guess what? You die and you live forever. We are with him in the likeness of his resurrection. Now you say, well, Brother Book ain't never heard that. Paul said, don't you know these things? Don't you know this? It's evidently the Roman believers may not have knew it. And it may be evident that you and I don't know it as well. So that's why Paul is trying to get us to the point that once you understand what Christ did, and once you understand your baptism, then you're going to understand that that baptism puts you in him, with him. So I am now identified with Christ. So why is it that I don't keep on sinning? The reason I don't keep on sinning, the reason why I'm not a habitual sinner, Staying in my sin, continuing in my sin, remaining in my sin, is because now I understand who I'm with. Who I'm with. And he said, don't you know this? Don't you know that when you died, you no longer continue to sin? Because you, dead, you died to sin. And dead men don't keep on sinning. But I like what he said again in 2 Timothy 2, 12, very next verse. He says, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, guess what? He's going to deny us. We are going to reign. We're going to rule with him. He said in Colossians 2 and verse number 12, he said, we are buried with him. In uh, baptism, wherein also we are raised with him through the faith of the operation of God who raised him uh, from the dead. Something takes place in baptism. We may not understand it all. We may not be able to comprehend all the what Paul is saying here, trying to take this text verse by verse. But Paul tells us that we are buried with Christ. We are identified with him. We're in baptism. And we are raised with him through faith in the operation of God. God, there is a operation that takes place. I can't explain it. I don't know how God does it, but he does. 
Because, see, I can't even think like God. God. God's thoughts are so much higher than my thoughts, and his ways are so much higher than my ways. My little finite mind cannot even understand the, the finite God. I, I just can't grab it. Yeah. But God does something. And he raised Jesus from the dead. And when you and I come up out of that water, it is a representation that we have been raised just like Jesus. I'm with him right now. Notice what he said in verse 13, Colossians 2. He said, and you, being dead in your sin and the uncircumcision of your flesh, has he quickened together with him, having forgiven you of all of your trespasses. You see, again, Paul oftentimes makes statements of, of us being with him. See, you and I are not out here all alone. We are not lone range, range of Christians. We are with him. That's why I live the way I live. That's why I do the things I do. That's why I say the things I say. Why? Because, see, I am with him, and he is with me. Paul puts it this way in Ephesians 2, verse 5, and when we were dead in sin, has he quickened us together, what? With Christ, for by grace you are saved. We are with him, buried with him, and we are going to be raised with him. When you get over to chapter 8 in verse in the book of Romans, verse 17, Paul says this. Again, I told you, chapter 6, 7, and 8, he's dealing with the same, he's going to answer the same question. But in chapter 8, verse 17, he said, And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and we are joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we shall also glorify together. We are with him. And I think that's the point that I'm trying to get us to see, that once we in, went in that water, and we quote Romans 6, verses 3 and 4, just about every time we get ready to baptize somebody or we share with them the gospel, one of the scriptures we use in baptism is Romans 6, verses 3 and 4. But have we ever really explained what Paul is saying in this verse? Now, baptism is important because baptism unites us with Christ, identifies us with him. That's important. But we need to explain what Paul is dealing with. And what he's dealing with is answering now the question. Well, what's the question? The question is, if I keep sinning, will God continue to shower more grace upon me? The more I sin, the more grace I receive. That's the question. Paul is going to use baptism as an answer to that question. But then notice he says in verse number six, knowing this. So I like the way Paul always used that word knowing. He's going to say that throughout the book of Romans. Knowing this. Come on. In other words, Paul said, there are some things you just need to know. Don't go through life not knowing these things. And sometimes I feel kind of guilty because as a preacher, maybe it's my fault that I hadn't really taught these things. But then again, I say to myself, some things you need to be reading and, and asking the Holy Spirit to teach you. Paul said, don't you know these things? Don't you know this? Now, how did they know it? Because the gospel in Rome, the church in Rome, was not established by Paul. Quite naturally, there was someone that may have went through and continued to educate or continue to teach them and build them up and encourage them, but Paul had never been. 
Matter of fact, uh, you remember when we first started the book of Romans? Maybe it, it was the church uh, was established by somebody that was there on the day of Pentecost that took the gospel back. You know, there, I don't know. But I know it wasn't Paul. Because we really looking at about 30 years that the church had already been in Rome when Paul writes this letter. And Paul said, in that amount of time, there are some things you guys just ought to know by now. And some of us have been in the church a lot longer. And there are some things that we just need to know. Now, here again is another thing Paul, Paul is about to say. He said, knowing this, don't you know that our old man is crucified with him? That the body of sin might be destroyed? That henceforth we should not serve sin? Don't you know that you, the old man, that old person you are before you come up out of that water and you begin to be a new creature in Christ and you are now walking in a newness of life? Don't you realize that old person was crucified with him? The way you used to be before you became a believer, before you became a child of God, the way you used to be, guess what? When you died to sin, you was crucified with Christ. So when Christ was crucified on the cross, you was crucified as well. Don't you know that? So therefore, that's why you don't continue to sin. That's why you don't continue to remain in sin or to live in sin or dwell in sin. That's why you're not a habitual sinner because you've been crucified with him and that that body of sin might be what? Destroyed. It's gone. Now again, I'm not saying you're not going to ever sin. So that ain't what Paul said. Paul going to say, keep reading at the end of this chapter, you're going to tell us that, that we all sin. But that ain't what Paul is dealing with. He's talking about a lifestyle of sin. That you ain't going to continue to live that lifestyle of sin. Because now you realize and you recognize who you really are. So then he says, henceforth. We should not serve sin. In other words, sin shouldn't be our master. Yes, sir. Sin shouldn't be the what's controlling us. Yes, sir. I don't live and I don't respond to sin. You got to tell sin, sin, I'm not listening to you. You are not my master. You are not the one that tells me what to do. But if you are still in the flesh, that old fleshly part of you is going to come up and you ought to start sinning just like you did before. But Paul said, you ought to know this, that that old person, that's not you anymore. And I don't care how much the devil whisper in your ear and tell you that you haven't changed and you ain't no different and you still the same as you used to be. Look at you. Look, look at your life. Look at what you're doing. Look at what you did yesterday. Look at what you just said. You better tell the devil, no. That old person, that old Anthony has been crucified. And I'm a different person now. But if you listen to him, he'll convince you just like he convinced Eve. When he told Eve, did God really say? You can go ahead and eat. God trying to hold something out on you. Just go ahead. And she listened to the lies of the devil. And there are many of us that would listen to the lies of the devil, not realizing that we, have, we are dead to sin and we don't serve sin any longer. But let's end with verse number seven. Because verse seven says, for he that is dead is free Come on. from sin. Dead. Have you realized that? Mm. You're free from mm. sin. 
Sin no longer have you captive. Why? Because you are dead. You are a dead person. And because you are dead, you are free from sin. Glory. Not free to sin, but free from sin. Glory. That's a big difference. Because if you think you can keep on sinning so that grace will abound more and more, you feel, you feel like you have a license to sin now because grace is going to abound much more. If you think you got a license to sin, you miss what Paul said. Paul did not say you are dead to sin. You are dead from. You are free from sin. Not free to sin. I'm free from it. Sin no longer controls me. Sin no longer has dominion over me. Sin is no longer my master. Because I am now free in Christ. And I'm going to follow him. Why? Because I'm with him. He took me, that old me, and nailed it to the cross. I don't know how many of us really realize and recognize that. We see those pictures all the time of Jesus nailed to the cross. But have you ever saw yourself? They'll bear with him. Have you ever saw yourself? Because when he was nailed, when he was crucified, you was also crucified with him. And if we can ever get that in our sight, if we can ever get that down deep, down inside of us, then there's a lot of sin we will not commit. Why? Because now I recognize who I am. In him. I'm not free to sin. But I'm free from sin. Oh, this is this is meaty. It's a lot more meat on the bone. That we ain't got to yet. But we're going to get there. You just got to stay with me. And, and, and we're going to suck the bone. I know sometimes me and my wife be out and I be having ribs. And I'd be leaving a little bit of meat on that bone. And she'll reach over on my plate and she'll say, honey, you left some meat on that bone. And then she'll, she'll take that bone and start sucking the meat off the bone. Well, that's what we're going to do in the book of Romans. I'm going to try my best not to leave no meat on the bone. We're going we're gonna to clean the bone because it's a lot of meat. It's a meaty chest. Okay, my time is up. May God bless you. We'll pick right up here with verse number eight. Lord's willing to own the next number next week. Let's end with a prayer. But before I end with a prayer, let me make one announcement. Uh, I do want to thank everyone that have uh, sent us cards and sent us gifts. I just want to thank everyone that have done that thus far, and I appreciate uh, you guys doing that. So what else? Merry Christmas. And yeah, and a Merry Christmas to all of you. Because I may not see you guys before Christmas, but hope you guys stay safe, stay healthy, and may God bless you. Remember the real reason for the season. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again. In the mighty name of Jesus, we ask that you continue to watch over us and bless us. Keep us all healthy. Keep us strong. Father, help us all as we go through this text. Help us to understand who we are in you. And we are free. We are free from sin. In the mighty name of Jesus, we ask. Amen. Good night, everyone.